Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well considering the circumstances of the pandemic. First of all, we want to sincerely thank you for your time and welcome you to today's webinar hosted by the Retirement Advantage. Today, we will be discussing MEPS, PEPS, and MEAPS. My name is Bill Sonegal. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director for the Retirement Advantage. Today's primary presenters are Jim McCory and Trey Galuppi, TRA's MEP Specialist. At TRA, we're excited about the expanded opportunities that the SECURE Act will bring to the retirement plan sponsors and advisors, and we can't think of a better person more qualified to explain these opportunities than Trey. Trey is a retirement plan subject matter expert and valued consultative resource for advisors and plan sponsors nationwide. Trey joined TRA at the beginning of 2020 and is primarily responsible for working with TRA's regional sales consultants, focusing on the overall expansion of the firm's consulting capabilities in the areas of group-sponsored plans. This will include MEPs, PEOs, PEPs, MEAPs, and producer group organizations. In an effort to align these plans with record-keeping partners and distribution organizations that leverage TRA services. Before we begin, I just wanted to give a quick review of the functionality of GoToWebinar. Everyone that logs in is on, is on mute just to avoid any background noises. To submit questions or comments, use the chat or questions pane located on the right side of your screen. You can enter your questions and comments throughout the presentation, then we'll answer the questions at the end of the webinar. We'll now segue over to Trey to go over the agenda as well as a brief review of the SECURE Act and how it's impacting plant sponsors and advisors. Trey? Try to get back in on a panelist. I got in first and I was fine, but I went in as a panelist, so then I tried. Trey? Yep, sorry about that. Uh, I was just uh, just bringing Jim on. I know there were some technical difficulties there. I'm going to bring uh, Jim McCrory on with us as well right now. Hang on one second. All right. Thank you very much, Bill. I, I do appreciate the uh, the introduction in here. And what we want to do is is take a look at some of the today's topics that we're going to be kind of going through on this and. We're going to spend just a moment explaining a little bit about uh, the TRA and Lincoln at a glance in case anybody's not familiar with the Retirement Advantage or with uh, Lincoln's capabilities in here as a record-keeping platform. But we're going to be spending some time discussing the three main types of the group plan. Multiple employer plans, commonly referred to as MEPs, pulled employer plans, now known as PEPs, and multiple employer aggregation programs uh, called a MEAP. Our focus is really going to be on the structure of each of these types of plans, how they're sponsored, and who can sponsor each type, and then provide some insights and suitability for each plan type by exploring some of the advantages and potential disadvantages of each of these plans. We'll also show some of the marketing and sales materials that support these types of plans and what you can experience and what you have access to from a resource perspective as an advisor. And we'll take a little bit of time at the very end here just to answer some of your questions that are coming through. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Retirement Advantage, here's just a brief overview as to kind of who we are at a glance on here. Um, we do stretch across all 50 states on this, and we've been in business doing TPA administration and 316 administration here for 24 years. Uh, currently, we've got about $8.5 billion under plan assets uh, for administration, and we employ uh, close to 200 employees um, that are spread out throughout the country. We've got uh, currently relationships with around 8,500 plan sponsors, and we've represented over 15 different regional sales consultants throughout the country. Uh, joining us today here is going to be Jim McCrory with Lincoln Financial Distributors. And in case anybody is unfamiliar with Lincoln's record-keeping capabilities or size in the industry, uh, we've provided some basic information here uh, on this slide just to convey a little bit of Lincoln's size and scope. We also want to thank Jim McCrory for being here with us today and look forward to some of his insights on these topic matters. So before we get started, I just wanted to run through some of the terminologies that you guys will hear throughout the presentation. Um, I'll be discussing MEPS on here, and that's an acronym standing for Multiple Employer Plan. Um, these are the formerly known as closed MEPS is what we're going to be dealing with today in, in this presentation. The PEPS, uh, this is the newest introduction here from the SECURE Act signed back in December of 2019, and this is for pulled employer plans. Uh, these are sponsored by what's called a pulled plan provider, or PPP. You may hear me talking a little bit about that. 
And then we're also going to be uh, introducing the MEAP, which is the Multiple Employer Aggregation Program. Um, we may make some references here to open multiple employer plans. These are platforms that operate kind of in the same capacity as a closed MEP, with the exception that individual Form 5500s are filed on behalf of each of the adopting employers. And then we'll make some references to ERISA 316. This is the section of ERISA that identifies and names the plan fiduciary who is the listed plan So let's dive into the presentation here, um, with the overview being the types of group retirement plans. And as I mentioned, our focus today is really on the three types of group retirement plans available, MEPS, PEPS, and MEAPS. So to better understand the basic structure of these types of plans, it's important to first recognize some of the fundamental traits each of these plans currently has. A multiple employer plan, or a MEP, is a 401k plan that's sponsored by an appropriate entity such as an association or professional employer organization, known as a PEO, which allows various employers to band together to create one large 401k plan. Now, prior to the SECURE Act being passed on December 20th of last year, these plans were often referred to as closed maps. Uh, and they do have a single form 5500, which is filed, covering and identifying all adopting employers of the plan. Multiple employer plans also require a business nexus to exist. And this is achieved generally through a bona fide trade association, a PEO, and of course, businesses under common ownership. All three of these group plans provide for centralized plan fiduciaries that handle the responsibilities associated with the administration and the oversight of retirement plans. Uh, the polled employer plans, or PEPs, are the newest type of plan that's under the SECURE Act, and these are intended to operate under the regulations of the multiple employer plans. The fundamental differences between the PEPs is that these types of plans do not require any type of business nexus to be grouped together under a single Form 5500 and reported as a single 401k plan with the Department of Labor and with the IRS. Additionally, PEP plans must also be sponsored by what the SECURE Act identifies as a pulled plan provider, or PPP, and the details for registering as a PPP are expected to be released at a little bit later time this year. The MEAP plans operate in a different reporting capacity than the MEPs or the PEPs, in that the Centralized Plan Administrator, or 316, will prepare and sign a Form 5500 for each adopting employer of the MEAP, eliminating any requirement or fees for a group audit to be conducted. In addition to the administrative reduction, the structure also provides for centralized fiduciary roles, provide, providing mitigation of the responsibilities associated under a plan sponsor, trustee, investment management responsibilities to the adopting employer. Similar to the PEPs, there is no business nexus requirement for an employer to adopt this type of a plan. So let's take a closer look at each of these models separately, beginning with the MEPs. When discussing the best solution for a client considering sponsoring a group such as a MEP on here, it's important to know who can actually sponsor this type of plan. ERISA identifies the main entities permitted to sponsor and offer a MEP are PEOs, Professional Employer Organization, um, because a business nexus exists here through the co-employment relationship as a PEO is considered the employer of record and files a single ERISA plan under the PEO's tax ID number. Bonafide trade associations um, and businesses under common ownership. And lastly, these types of plans require a group audit to be conducted based on the number of total eligible participants across all adopting employers of the MEP. So let's take a look at the pulled employer plans. For the most part, a pulled employer plan will operate really under the same requirements that a multiple employer plan does, with a few notable differences. And as we mentioned earlier, the PEPs will not require any type of business nexus and may be offered to employers across multiple industries uh, and of varying shapes and sizes. PEPs are intended to be filed as a single ERISA plan with the DOL and IRS and would, require, would be required to conduct an audit when a group um, audit is necessary. So PEPs will also receive a little bit of audit relief uh, on here from their requirements, where we see under the MEPs and single employer plans, as well as the MEAP, an audit will be required for plans containing 100 or more eligible participants stated on the Form 5500 which is also subject to the 8120 rule. 
the pulled employer plans operate with a little bit more lenient uh, flexibilities here for the audit requirement in that a group audit can be avoided provided that first, no single adopting employer has more than 100 eligible participants, and second, the combined number of eligible participants in the entire PEP does not exceed 1,000. So similar to, uh, similar to the MEPs, when discussing PEPs suitability for a client, it is important for us to understand who can actually sponsor this type of plan. A PEP must be sponsored by what the SECURE Act is identifying as a pulled plan provider or PPP. The pulled plan provider would be a service provider of the plan and is required to register with the Department of Labor and the IRS as such. The specific requirements for registering as a PPP are expected to be released in the Treasury regs later this year. Uh, these guidelines are also expected to address any of the self-dealing exemptions that may impact the PPP's organizational capabilities, such as fund management and or oversight. And I'll also point out that current interpretations of the SECURE Act indicate that the PPP could file individual Form 5500s on behalf of each adopting employer as opposed to one single combined 5500. Now let's explore the Multiple Employer Aggregation Program, or MEAP plan. A MEAP is a group of 401k program. It's a group 401k program designed to, make, to be made available for organizations, members, or clients. Similar to the MEP and PEP plans, these types of plans provide for a centralized plan administrator, fund menu, and plan investment provider. Also similar to the MEPs and the PEPs, these plans utilize a centralized record keeper and third-party administrator. Like the aforementioned PEPs, the MEAPs may be adopted by multiple unrelated employers. Adopting employers of the MEAP are capable of outsourcing virtually the same responsibilities and administrative burdens as seen in the adoption of the MEPs or the PEP plans. So as I mentioned with both the, the MEPs and the PEPs, it's important to understand who can actually endorse or offer a MEAP to their clients or members. And virtually any group or organization can become an endorser of a MEAP as they're not listed as the plan sponsor of a group of plans. The endorser of the MEAP does not assume additional administrative or other fiduciary responsibilities and liabilities for endorsing the plan as the centralized plan administrator prepares, signs, and files the individual Form 5500 on behalf of every adopter of the MEAP. So we're taking a more visual approach to the liabilities and responsibility out of outsourcing uh, these types of benefits in the group plan. This slide is really intended to help illustrate the adopting employers of a MEP, PEP, or MEAP plan and how they will mitigate a large portion of their fiduciary liabilities as the plan administrator, identified in ERISA Sections 316, as well as the fund management fiduciaries under ERISA Sections 321 or 338 to the appointed fiduciaries of these types of group plan platforms. And upon choosing to join or adopt, a MEP, PEP, or MEAP plan, the single employer plan sponsor has effectively transferred the responsibilities and tasks associated with their role as a single plan sponsor to the appointed fiduciaries within each of these plan types. At this point, the employer has effectively become what is known as an adopting employer, which makes him or her free to focus on their business objectives without the burden of maintaining all aspects of compliance associated with offering a qualified retirement plan to their employees. And as we explore a little bit of the levels here of control and client accessibility in these different types of group plans, this slide is really intended to illustrate the varying levels of control each plan type exemplifies. The order of the plans on the screen is based on the assumed size and scope of these plans. The pet plans would be controlled and marketed by the PPP, and would carry the highest amount of responsibility as the PEP plan is capable of covering a larger group of employers since no business nexus is required. The MEP plans are listed really below the PEP plan as the plan sponsor of the MEP is responsible for a more limited group of employers or members uh, of that specific group, such as a PEO or a specific association. These plans would be marketed and, de and designed for that specific group whereas the MEAP can be custom designed for a specific group to endorse or market without the endorser being required to incur administrative burdens or additional financial responsibilities, such as a group audit. So 
by now most of you guys are probably asking yourself, you know, what's the difference between the MEPS and PEP versus the MEAP style plant? So I'd like to take a few minutes here. I'm going to turn this over to Jim McCrory to really run through some of the differences here and, and what these applications really look like. So with that being said, I'll turn this over to Jim and I'll let you take it away. Well, Trey, thank you very much. So this chart illustrates in a bite concise manner uh, exactly what a lot of the major differences are. And so the first thing to understand is whether we're talking about a MAP, a PAP, or, or a MEAP, we're talking about a group of individual plans that we're putting together into a, some type of a program. And the MEP or PAP or the MEAP determines from a compliance perspective and from an IRS perspective how it's going to be ministered going forward. What we'll tell you is, for instance, in Lincoln's perspective, we recommend keep them in price the same. So the only thing that's really going to be different is what we talk about now. So if you decided to put together your group and run it as a PEP or a MAP, it's going to be considered by the IRS to be a single plan for two purposes only. For the 5500 purpose, because there's going to be a single 5500 assigned for the entire group. And because you're presumably going to have more than 120 total uh, individual participants in it, we're going to get to a single MEP plan level audit. And the organization, either the organization will be the plan sponsor or the full plan provider will, in a PEP scenario will be the full plan provider or will be the plan sponsor. You can always outsource some responsibilities to a 316 or, a, or an investment 320 or 338. That's typically how the structure is going to work. In a MEAP structure, that's considered by the IRS to be a group of individual plans. So what you have is you have individual 5500s that are typically signed and filed by the MEAP 316. So you get a similar experience for the plan sponsor, meaning they don't have to deal with the 5500. The second part of it is that you fall back into the single plan rules in regards to audits because there's no MEAP level audit. If you have a small plan, which, prob which we have found 95 plus percent of the plans and MAPs and et cetera, are usually plans that aren't audit eligible plans anyway. Uh, they don't have to deal with an audit and because there's no audit for the MEAP and they're not gonna have an audit anyway. But certainly the plans that are audit eligible plans, I mean those plans north of 100 are going to have to have the audit and they'll still be done the same way. Because there's not a plan sponsor of a MAP, we always have a, a 316 and an investment fiduciary, generally a 338 that's involved with the MEAP so that the plan sponsor can get the similar type of outsourcing experience that they get from the MAP. Uh, so instead of outsourcing to a plan sponsor, you're outsourcing to the 316 and the 338. And one thing that's nice is the organization, the organization that is, is, is doing a MEAP versus a MAP has a much lower fiduciary standard because they're simply an endorser of a program uh, as opposed to being plan sponsors of all the plans inside the, the uh, MAP. So if we'll go down below here, I'm going to go to the questions first of all. When people call us up and they want to talk about doing uh, maps, and by the way, everybody that calls has a map opportunity because the word map has become that word that just means group of plans. So the first thing that we do when somebody calls us up to, just, to talk to discuss a map is to determine whether or not under the current rules you can do a map. So let me show a list of uh, some examples of where you can do a map on the next slide. So on, right now, under the current rules, as, a, as far as a map, you can do it in industry-based associations like a building and contractor association, a bar association, manufacturing association, things like that, an industry-based association. You can also do them in locality-based. For instance, the primary thing we mean by that is a chamber of commerce. You can do MEPs inside of PEOs, uh, and you can also do it if it makes sense in a common ownership group if you're looking for ways to consolidate multiple items. MEAPs can pretty much be done anywhere you can do a map, plus it opens up the doors for a lot of other types of opportunities. You can do them inside of banks and credit unions, ASOs and MSOs, think co-ops and, and HR outsourcing type of organizations. You can do it in payroll companies. Heck, you can do it with a accounting, accounting firm. We're doing with PNC firms, franchising groups. There's a lot of places where you can do a MEAP that you can't do a map. So the first thing we determine is can you do a map or not? Let's go back to the previous slide. The second question is, you want to ask your question, this question, does the common audit make sense? In my opinion, and opinion of many, the primary advantage of the MAP over the MEAP is the common audit. So let me give you a good example. We have a scenario right now where we are demapping a MAP and turning it into a MEAP, and here's why. There's not a single member of the state association that has more than 30 employees it's sitting in a MAP right now. 
Uh, they're acting as a plan sponsor, and they're paying twenty-five thousand dollars a year, which is coming out of plan assets to pay for the uh, pay for the map, which benefits no one because they will never have a member who's large enough to have an audit. Therefore, having this common audit is to the benefit of no one. So I like to just have the discussion on whether or not a common audit makes sense. If you're not going to have a, enough of people that are going to be joining this thing that will take advantage of the common audit, it might make more sense to go the MEAP route versus the MEP route. The next question you're going to want to understand is whether or not the organization that you might want to set this map up for is willing to assume plan sponsor responsibilities or not, or would they prefer to be the endorser? There's a lot of, uh, in fact, let's go to the fourth bullet point because I think it'll help you understand the third. Go back, I'm sorry, previous slide. What does your client really want? And when I say this, this is probably going to make sense to a lot of you. When I talk to a lot of associations one on one, and I talk with a lot of uh, uh, chambers that, for instance, could do multi employer plans. This is what they tell me. They say, Jim, we like the idea of offering a 401k benefit to our clients and to our members. But what we're not looking to do is to take on any extra work, responsibility, or liability, meaning the role of the plan sponsor. We're really not looking to take on any potential cost which there could be some cost for the audit if there's not a large enough map to be able to absorb the cost of the audit. And in an ideal world, we'd like to get a little bit of revenue if possible. Now, in a map, they're a plan sponsor. You can't do that because that's creative transaction if you're a plan sponsor. In a MEAP world, they're an endorser, and they're providing a service to their, to their members. Uh, so we can build in a small service fee. It's generally five basis points or less uh, uh, because they're not doing a lot, but they are doing something to help maintain this MEAP. So it does give them the ability to do that. Another advantage of that some advisors are seeing with the me app over the map, but again, and, and I'm just trying to really distinguish the two for you so you can decide what's best for your opportunity. Again, here at Lincoln, we price them the same, we record keep them the same, so we can go either way. But the uh, one of the, the, the little nuances of this that a lot of people don't think about is since a map and a PEP are considered to be a single plan, generally you got one VOR. And, uh, you know, you build these plans one at a time. And if, for instance, if you had a map with an association, the president changed and wanted to move the map to another advisor, one BOR signature and it could walk out the door. When we're talking about a MEAP, since it's considered to be a group of individual plans, one of the advantages is, is that they would have to get every single one of the plans to individually sign a BOR change uh, for that plan to move away. So from a protection standpoint, the advisors tend to like MEAP better than they like MAP. So uh, the good thing is that we have solutions with TRA across the board, whether MAP, PAP, of course, PAPs don't come into play until next year, but a MAP or PAP or MEAP fits your group plan needs. We're happy to discuss these for you. Trey, I'm going to turn it back to you. No, thank you very much, Jim. I really appreciate it. You know, looking at the endorsers of the MEAP and just kind of piggybacking a little bit off of what Jim had, had provided there in that content, you know, they're capable of providing an easy, cost-effective solution for their member clients without incurring that, you know, additional financial or administrative burdens and virtually no liability there. You know, and as Jim mentioned, revenue can be built into the structure here for the MEAP for the endorsers of these types of plans. Endorsers of the MEAP plans can range from, you know, CPA firms to associations, to payroll companies, and, and well beyond that. So, Really, kind of to, to reiterate a little bit more about what Jim had, had mentioned in here about some of these questions, you know, I want to take a closer look at the necessary questions in here to help determine which plan is right for which client. So, you know, really to, to discuss this, and as we, as we sort of open up the window here for suitability on there, you know, I just wanted to reiterate some of those questions, right? Is, is your organization permitted to sponsor a MEP or a PEP plan? Um, or is a MEAP plan, you know, more suitable for the actual sponsor's needs? Um, what level of control, responsibility, and involvement do you want, you know, uh, to take on as a endorser or as a plan sponsor? What do you want your plan to accomplish? We, we had discussed that, and and certainly the most important question here on this thing is really, does a group audit make sense based on your clients or members' sizes? So, pending the client's answers to these questions will really provide a little bit more of a refined understanding for suitability. All right, and so this slide is really just intended to serve as a basic outlay of some of those key components here for the different types of group plans that are in discussion for either sponsoring or endorsing a prospective client into this type of plan. And the last point addressed on this really pertains to the broker of record signatures. 
Um, and you know, I won't, I won't go ahead and reiterate everything on there that, that Jim had said, but um, I'm sure that there are certainly some advisors here that, that are on the, this call that may have already experienced some of this, um, making a, a broker of record change in there and having to lose that entire book of business uh, based on either a new board of trustees or a new president that comes into an association and wanting to bring in maybe a colleague or an acquaintance that they already had through a prior relationship. And you end up losing that entire book of business from one signature overnight. So the Me app really does help to try to protect the advisors on that sense by retaining their, their book of business, by making it a little bit more sticky uh, so that these, these adopters are not you know, being forced out of these types of, of structures in here. Uh, and even so, if a adopter leaves an association, they're not going to be required to uh, remove and, and leave the Me app if that was a structure that was put in there. So. As we as we kind of end up and, and come to sort of the uh, the, the latter part here of our, of our presentation, I wanted to introduce a few examples of the sales support and the marketing materials that are available for you or your endorser clients on the MEAP style plan. And the MEAP structure is very flexible and it can accommodate for compensation to be paid out through a variety of different ways. So this can either be paid out as the two primary forms in here, just gonna be either a commission structure and that can either be a deposit base or a trail, um, you know, as a straight trail on there. And then it can also be designed in here to facilitate compensation through a fee-for-service model, such as, you know, an RIA. Uh, and it's also been approved and modified for specific broker-dealer compensation structures as well, uh, such as, you know, a Merrill Lynch RIA model. Um, and all of these pieces can be custom created to represent the endorser as well as the advisor or the RIA associated with the opportunity. I'm going to take a moment here and just pull up a piece that uh, that was created on this that we use regularly frequently. And this is your basic proposal template. This is the brochure that, that an endorser or an advisor can receive from us. And we can custom promote this, put the uh, endorser's logo on it or the opportunities logo here on that. We would automatically pre-populate for the advisor's name on this and contact information and identify those specific roles in here from a service provider perspective inside of this brochure. So this is going to list here for the oversight, whoever that endorser would end up being, uh, or we can make that generic. As you see here, the advisor's complete 401k solution. Um, we also have the record keeper identified as LinkedIn Financial on this, and we have the advisory services up here where you're going to see your name listed as the specific advisor for that MEAP opportunity. Uh, in most of these structures, we have a 338 that is built in here as Morningstar. However, there are so, certain other products and, and platforms under the MEAP that we have done where there is no 338, and the RIA can assume the 321 fiduciary role, uh, such as in Merrill Lynch. And then we'll also identify here the 316, as uh, the Retirement Advantage TRA is assuming the 316 roles, and that is embedded and built in as a service across all adopters of the plan. We'll have, uh, this is just a sample fund lineup in here, and this was already built in with uh, the basis points in the share class to accommodate the regular commission structure, not the RIA structure that would be built on a zero revenue chassis. Um, the way that these plans are priced out is really just on a grid here. So what you're seeing is this top part of the grid is going to identify what the average account balance is for the participants of a specific adopter or client inside of uh, a group of plans. And then we'll identify on the left what their total assets are, match those numbers up, and that will identify us what that actual asset charge is. Now, this is uh, for any of you that have already tried to receive proposals on multiple employer plans or even potentially for pet plans as of right now. There's a lot of information that really needs to be generated in order to produce that sort of all-in number and what that looks like. Um, a lot of times, you know, you as the advisor are really playing some sort of coordinated game in here to try to link up and get the pricing from the 316, from the TPA, from the record keeper, uh, compiling what your own advisory fees are going to look like, and then figuring out, you know, what that total asset charge would be, as well as creating that fund lineup there. So that process can, can be somewhat time consuming to a degree, uh, especially when we're talking about this type of product going in with an endorser or uh, some sort of 
um, aggregator in here, such as an association or a CPA firm or something along those lines, payroll companies even, certainly. Uh, they have the ability to generate a proposal for one of their clients or their members in a matter of two or three minutes, as opposed to potentially two or three weeks uh, to be able to get that proposal out. Everything will be included on here. And as you can see from the bottom, you're already your advisory services and compensation there is built into this. The TPA services are already built in. The Morningstar element is built in. And then we'll run through some of the hard dollar fees that are associated with the plan as well. Uh, generally, there is a setup fee for plans that are not a startup plan, and that is $750. And there's an annual fee for plans that are above $250,000 up to $5 million of $750. Plans that go above that amount of the $5 million mark are really going to be custom priced out. And that can be done in a, in a matter, of, again, of, of a call on here, uh, running that through both Lincoln and the TRA side to be able to come up with the best pricing in there for that custom model for these much larger group opportunities. Another piece that, that I do want to pull up and, and show in here from a marketing perspective is a piece that uh, Lincoln had designed in here called the New Business Perspective on 401k Plans. And this is really just identifying what the MEAP opportunity looks like in here. Um, you know, talking about the, the three main points of why this is beneficial, because it's easy, it protects them, and certainly is cost competitive on here. Uh, this is a more visual side of showing kind of what we were introducing before with the liability responsibilities being removed. What you're seeing on the left here is all the responsibilities that a plan sponsor has when they are uh, offering a 401k plan to their employees as a single employer plan sponsor. And then when you look over to the right side on the green section in here, that's what they're left with after joining into a MEAP program. Uh, additionally, if they are running uh, with a uh, outsourced payroll company in here, most of those things on the left-hand side are already being handled for them by the payroll company, the bottom three to be specific. So that is our overall presentation that we wanted to be able to show in here, I do want to be able to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit more about what type of support that all of you will end up receiving from these types of plans. So uh, when we look at our national team, that's really going to be comprised of Jim McCrory, myself, uh, Jim's internal, John Hobson on here, uh, and running that from, from a more national perspective. But as we look to identify and, and um, you know, kind of put some pictures here with, with some names on this, and most of you on the line will, will certainly know at least one of these folks on here. We've got the regional team in here that really is, is your specific dedicated team for Florida. And uh, that's going to be comprised of, of Jim Gilligan and Chris Capullo, uh, who are our wholesalers for the state of Florida. And I believe, uh, you know, Chris covers a little bit more of the uh, middle part of the state upwards into you know the Jacksonville areas and over into Tampa. Chris, I'll let you kind of identify a little bit about what your area is as well as you, Jim. Um, and then we also have Matt Solomon in here from the TRA standpoint. And Matt lives over in, uh, in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area and uh, very centralized in here for the state to be able to make any type of arrangements or meetings that, uh, that are needed, of course, once we're all allowed to actually travel and have a meeting. Um, at any point, any of us are certainly available and willing to jump on a webinar for you at any point to be able to kind of discuss the intricacies of this, show a potential adopter or sponsor or endorser what their specific plan would look like with their logo on it, with their endorser fee potentially, um, and really how that structure works in a much more sophisticated, customized manner in there that is applicable to that specific option or uh, opportunity. We also have Ryan Racine on the line here with us as well, who is the uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Regional Sales Director. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and just kind of turn this over. Jim, I'd like you to mention a couple little things about, uh, about your team and about your capabilities, as well as Chris and, and Dennis, if you guys, uh, I'm sorry, and Ryan, if you guys would like to go ahead and just talk a little bit about kind of what uh, support you guys can provide as well. Sure. Um... Well, I cover from basically uh, bottom part of Orlando down to South Florida. Chris covers up into Jacksonville down to Orlando, and Ryan is really the left coast, Tampa, Naples, up into the Panhandle, I believe, and he can tell you that. But uh, 
Uh, I think the opportunity here is for us to be able to find these opportunities and just work with TRA specifically because I can tell you they have this nailed down from a 316 perspective as well as a um, record keeping administration integration with Lincoln. So uh, with the marketing materials, this just makes sense. And I think the um, last thing I'll say is when we get out of this funk here, I think coming out the other end, we're going to find a lot of plan sponsors just want things to be easier than what they had in the past. So we're here having more value with hopefully the same cost or less. So I'll turn it over to Chris. All right, Chris is Yeah, the lines may be muted on that. I um, was hoping to uh, to get those off. Yeah. But, uh, no, no worries in there. Um, what we want to do, I know that we've got about five more minutes here of our of our presentation. I did want to try to turn this over and, and answer some of the questions that have been coming in throughout the presentation. So, if you could, Bill, um, if you want to go ahead and, and read out some of those uh, those questions that were coming through, and we can try to get those answered. And again, for everybody that that is, has sent in a question or has a question on here. Uh, and if we're not able to get to that during this this presentation, we will certainly shoot you an email back and, and make sure that your question gets answered right away. Here's some contact information for us as well in case you need to reach out to us directly. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Jim and Jim. Uh, we had a couple of questions during the presentation, so I'll just proceed. First question, can the MEAP structure work for 403B plans as well? So Jim, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I know we had a, a conversation about that yesterday, but uh, I'll let you kind of uh, take on that one. But uh, ultimately the, the simple answer is um, the same components that are associated with a 403B uh, under our MEAP can be recreated to provide that type of solution for a 403B tenant, but there is no 403B MEAP at this time. That's correct. And so what we do is if you have, uh, if you happen to have some 403B plans that you're wanting for the MEAP, we do have some underwriting requirements of what we need for those of at least a million dollars. So we're not doing startup 403Bs at this point in time. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Next question, what size client or group would an endorser need to establish a MEAP? So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jim. That's yeah, typically, typically we, uh, when we're doing it, we like to see about three to five million dollars of assets that are gonna get into roll it. We can go a little bit under that, but typically we're looking for that number. Normally when we're setting one up, uh, we're always gonna have their plan because their plan is the anchor plan to start the program. But usually when you're dealing with an association or a chamber, there's also some board members that have to vote on getting this thing up and running. And usually we get a plan or two from them, and that's usually more than enough. But we uh, we do evaluate, we're, like I said, generally we're looking for three to $5 million as a startup, but we do evaluate each opportunity. And if it's a good opportunity, we can come down a little on that number. Perfect. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually add a little bit to that that question in here. Um, you know, one of the one of the advantages that that we have found over doing the the me apps in here in comparison to the maps, and obviously nobody's done a pep yet, but uh, we're kind of gearing up for that that aspect, is when pricing is is created uh, during the initial infancy stages of building a map. Really, you know, following what Jim was saying, you're going to be required to have a certain minimum amount of assets to set up a map, um, and, and that's really going to be predicated off of either uh, the existing assets that are in there, letters of intent uh, for this, this business to come over. And if there's not a really high number of total assets available to kind of automatically convert or initially roll over, the pricing is really not going to be as favorable for these types of plans. And you may even find, you know, different record keeping entities that may even just refuse to set up a multiple employer plan there uh, for a group that doesn't have that potential or that ability to grow into Kind of what those normal minimums would look like for MEPS or PET plants. The MEAP really doesn't follow in, in, in those types of structures because these are going to be administered as individual plans and filed as such. So while the group of plans and scale is certainly achievable inside of the MEAP structure, it is not something that is a requirement that could have the, you know, 
sort of downhill snowball effect that you would have under a MEP or a PET plant, where potentially you could have one adopter really carrying the weight for the rest of the adopters inside of the plant. Um, you know, you have a $20 million multiple employer plan, and you've got one of the adopters that carries $10 million of that. Um, so if that one adopter left, you know, potentially you're running into a risk of losing favorable pricing on the overall map, um, or even worse than that, you know, losing that book of business right there uh, for that entire group of plans. So just wanted to add that in there that the, the MEAP structure in here does provide a little bit more flexibility with regard to pricing without having to have that already committed large amount of assets that you would normally find inside of the MEPs or the PEPs. But yeah, good question. Thanks, Trey. Next question. What does the endorser fee consist of and how, and how does it that work? The endorser fee, I'll take that. Endorser fee is really a service fee because they're providing that service for the members or the clients of the organization. And their role in this is really, along with the advisor, to provide oversight of the program to make sure they're providing a good program to their members. Typically, what gets built in is a declining scale that starts at about five basis points for your plans that are up to a million dollars, drops to four for the next million, three for the million after that, two for the million after that, and gets down to about one basis points for the plan above four million dollars. That's the normal scale. You can do a little bit more than that, but uh, uh, they're not doing a lot, and we, it's best probably keep the amount of the service fee consistent with the amount of uh, services being provided. And so that's the most typical thing that we see. Excellent. All right, well, with respect to time, um, we'll go ahead and, and conclude the presentation on here. But I did want to uh, just thank all of you again for taking the time to join this. I know uh, everybody's being relatively inundated right now, certainly on the advisory front, with uh, a ton of different webinars and, uh, and different presentations and WebExes to join. And uh, we really certainly appreciate you guys taking the time to join ours and listen to this and uh, certainly ask some, some really good questions here. So again, uh, our contact information is, is up on the screen. If you'd like to reach out to us a little bit more, uh, please feel free. I'll go ahead and put this slide back up here that also has our phone numbers, and this will conclude our presentation. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bill. And if you want to uh, mention something about uh, how Thank the you. attendees might be able to receive this, this presentation, um, you know, certainly go ahead. Sure. What I was planning on doing is uh, sending just a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a copy of the presentation deck and uh, a link to view the recorded webinar. So be on the lookout from that. It'll either be coming from Bill Sonegal at TRA401k.com or marketing at TRA401k.com. All right, and thank you all very much again for joining. We look forward to working with you soon. Have a safe, happy, healthy rest of the day and week, and uh, you know, please uh, be careful out there.